institution for MSK in the Philippines for now. And so uh, one of his of her trainee was uh, Dr. Ed Bayunat, who just also passed the uh, uh, RMSK exam. So uh, we congratulate her for that, for guiding, and at the same time allowing uh, uh, her trainees to to pass those exams. And uh, she's also working in different institutions, like he's a professor in the College of Medicine in Fatima University Medical Center, and he is she's also working in the Healthway Medical Clinics. So she's been doing a lot of all this uh, ultrasound and. And it's very unique for her because she's been exposed to a lot of uh, infectious problems in her center. And I would say she's got the most of all these cases uh, at this time. And so she's very much acquainted with what she's talking about, the infectious MSK conditions. And this is also uh, very interesting because this is also where you see a mix of uh, infection and to some extent uh, some issues on tumors because they these sometimes appear same and any other conditions related to that. So we're so happy to introduce to you Dr. Milane on Chuan. But before she begins, uh, let's just pause for a moment for a prayer. I would like to pray for her. Heavenly Father, we would like to entrust this uh, opportunity to come to your presence this morning to listen to Dr. Milane on Chuan to present a very interesting topic on MSK ultrasound of infectious conditions. We are so happy to learn and uh, experience uh, this kind of uh, unique topic and may your Holy Spirit and your guidance be upon her that she may be able to have the wisdom necessary to teach us this, this topic. Thank you, O oh God, for your grace and thank you for saving our lives, for serving it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Milane Ongchuan. Dr. Milane. Thank you so much, first and foremost, for that beautiful prayer, Dr. Jim. I am blessed because of you. I've been telling you ever since that I always feel blessed knowing you. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And thank you for your kind introduction. So yes, I would say that I am proud that in the Philippine Orthopedic Center, this is actually the institution in the Philippines wherein we are the catch basin of all kinds of musculoskeletal infections from soft tissues to bone, to peri-implant infections. So that's why this morning, actually my purpose is to be able to share with you, especially for those who practice in private hospitals, who cater to the upper class in the society, I would just like to share with you what we see in our um, institution in a low resource setting. And I would also share with you in a while the paper that we did the lead investigator of this paper is our first fellow in musculoskeletal ultrasound. So he finished it already, as Dr. Jim mentioned, Dr. Edgar David Bionat, and he already passed the RMSK. So we co-authored this paper, and uh, I will discuss it with you later. So again, it is my privilege to share with you our experience in Philippine Orthopedic Center in the sonographic appearance of musculoskeletal infections. Ultrasound screening before joint aspiration can aid diagnosis and decrease the risk of iatrogenic complications, bursal fluid collection, soft tissue abscess, and other fluid collections that would be undetected with fluoroscopy and even in blind or landmark guided aspiration and avoiding needle puncture of important structures. And it provides guidance for diagnostic or therapeutic aspiration, drainage or biopsy. So again, we will use our musculoskeletal ultrasound to differentiate, localize, ascertain, identified 
and provide guidance for diagnostic or therapeutic aspiration, drainage, or needle biopsy. This needle biopsy is very interesting. I'm going to share with you later on towards the end of the lecture that uh, Dr. Ed Bionat actually did it yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was yesterday, the other day, Wednesday, Wednesday that we did, uh, he did the needle biopsy aspiration ultrasound guided. I would just like to show you this study by Tile and colleagues. They studied the use of bedside ultrasound in emergency department patients with signs of cutaneous soft tissue infection, but no signs of obvious abscess. The use of ultrasound was found to change the management of a significant percentage of the study group. So by routinely utilizing ultrasound in the evaluation of these patients, the emergency physicians were able to avoid unnecessary drainage procedures as well as detect occult abscess. So this research supports the use of ultrasound in the evaluation of most patients with cellulitis presenting in the emergency room. And this is actually one of the many reasons why we get a lot of stat referrals from our orthopedic counterpart during their duty in the emergency room. Okay, now, and this is the paper that I'm proud to share with you. All of these cases were from Philippine Orthopedic Center. So as I mentioned earlier, I did this paper with uh, Dr. Bionat as the lead investigator. This was already accepted in the AIUM 2020 conference. And Ed is, was supposedly scheduled to do an oral presentation in New York last March. But then, of course, we all know what happened. COVID-19 pandemic happened. But recently, I think I saw this um, abstract on their website for the supposed 2020 conference of AIUM. The title of this study is The Utility of Musculoskeletal Ultrasound in Diagnosing Pyomyositis, a comparison with surgically and conservatively treated cases. The objective of this study was aimed to determine the accuracy of ultrasound in diagnosing pyomyositis. We all know that the easiest way and the fastest for diagnostic would be the ultrasound. It's faster than CT scan and MRI because if you have access to the ultrasound, you can easily schedule it. Like in our center, we have two ultrasound dedicated for musculoskeletal ultrasound. As compared to CT scan, we only have one, MRI, we only have one, and sometimes it would bug down. So the fastest really is to refer the patients to our section, the musculoskeletal section of our rehabilitation medicine department. Okay, so for the results, we had a total of 122 cases. So this our retrospective chart review. Of this, 57 were surgically treated, while 65 cases underwent conservative treatment. And 78% of these cases had antecedent trauma, whereas 66% underwent manual manipulation. So for those of you who are not from the Philippines, manual manipulation is what we call in our language, traditional hilo. So it's basically a masseuse. But here in the Philippines, most of the elderly would believe that their massage has a healing power. And together with the massage, it's not, it's not just the bare hands that they would use, but they would use essential oils, coconut oils, and other leaves. And this one, they put it over the skin, and sometimes they would advise the patient to put the skin for several, to put the leaves over the skin with the oil for several days. And we all know what's going to happen after that if you put that hot leaves with oil for several days over the skin. And then 59% presented with fever, elevated WPC, leukocytosis, ESR, and CRP were present and prevalent on admission. On this charge, all blood parameters displayed either normal values or decreasing trend in 98% of cases. Now for our result, Sonograph, sonographic findings corresponded with 95% of surgical cases confirmed through intraoperative findings and 89% of conservative cases through improved laboratory parameters. 
So we therefore concluded with this pilot study that the value of ultrasound is not limited to primarily as a screening tool, but a capable diagnostic imaging choice for pyomyositis, particularly in low resource setting, especially in tropical countries. Despite inherent data deficiencies, the results provided preliminary data on strength of ultrasound, particularly in the suppurative stage of pyomyositis. So that goes our pilot study, and I was just discussing this with Ed last Wednesday, and we both want to continue this study so that we can actually convince that we can use ultrasound as a preliminary diagnostic tool, especially in emergency setting. Okay, now let's go to the discussion now of the different sonographic appearance of various musculoskeletal infection. Let's start with septic arthritis. So joint infection, can you all hear me? Okay, let me continue. So as I said, our first would be septic arthritis. Joint infection a serious condition given the propensity for long-term morbidity if not recognized and treated early. So for septic arthritis, the most commonly affected joints would be the hip, the knee, the shoulder, elbow, and ankle. But of course, it can affect other joints as well. So for the possible pathomechanism of infection, so one would be hematogenous seeding of the synovium from a distant focus or an adjacent area of osteomyelitis. It could also be due to spread from a contiguous infected site, such as soft tissues in diabetic foot or inadvertent implantation during arthrocentesis or secondary to penetrating wounds and post-operative infection. So as I've mentioned earlier, I would again emphasize that in our country, it's quite different because even in the absence of the three that I've mentioned previously, we still get cases of septic arthritis. And you would be surprised because the history, the mother or the father or any relative who would bring the patient to the hospital would just say that the patient had a fall and then immediately after that, the grandmother or grandfather suggested to bring him to a traditional helot, the one who does manual manipulation. And then in less than 24 hours, the patient would feel rubor, calor, dolor over the area that was manipulated or that was massaged by the so-called masseuse. As I mentioned earlier, because most of our people here, especially um, in the lower class of the society, they believe that before they would go to a doctor because of financial constraint, they believe from generation to generation, it has been handed down to them that bringing their child to a traditional healer would solve all their problem. So these are the cases that we get in Philippine Orthopedic Center. So you'd be wondering, they don't have any open wound they look healthy, they're not underweight, they just had a history of a simple fall or like a fight between siblings. And then he was pushed over, he fell on the floor from the bed, and then he was brought to a helot. And then in 24 hours, swelling would start, warmth over the skin that was massaged would start, even without a fracture. So that would always, that is a common findings in our institution. So I hope you can also advise your patients that never, never to bring them to a traditional helot for all of you who are practicing in the Philippines. So the pattern for septic arthritis is usually monoarticular. 
So the joints involved, I've mentioned earlier, will be the hip, knee, shoulder, knee, and ankle. So for the radiographic changes, by the time joint space narrowing becomes apparent on x-ray, articular cartilage lysis is already established. And by the time that happens, it's already too late. It has already full-blown septic arthritis. So there's already a lot of infection going on around the joint. So causing now premature osteoarthritis, limitation of motion, limb shortening is likely to ensue. And for the late complications, you would now see joint subluxation, premature osteoarthritis, osteonecrosis, fibrous or bony ankylosis, and limb shortening. So ultrasound, more than any other imaging technique, has enabled septic arthritis to be identified early before significant cartilage lysis when radiographs are still not contributory. So you'll be surprised to see on sonographic findings that even if the x-ray would still be on the borderline of normal, you can already see some beginning sonographic findings of septic arthritis on ultrasound. So we also get cases like this, where in, in the ultrasound, we are already seeing distension of the capsule, of the joint capsule. But then when we retrieve the x-ray plate, the x-ray would still seem to be on the borderline of normal. There's still no gross swelling that can be seen on the x-ray in the area of the joint. But in the ultrasound, the capsule is already starting to be distended. And the echogenicity is also starting to be different. So the hallmark on ultrasound for septic arthritis would be, of course, presence of joint effusion. The joint recess will be distended in a patient with clinical signs of joint infection. And there is heterogeneous fluid collection that can be from anechoic to hyperechoic to hyperechoic. So the joint effusion would have a diffuse pattern of low-level echoes and clearly demarcated from the thickened synovial walls. It is highly hyperechoic effusions with hyperechoic debris and septation. Once you see signs of septation, lobulated septation and ultrasound, then that would give you an idea that this is already a severe stage or a late stage of infection. And on dynamic scan, what we call transducer compression or sonopalpation, you will see swirling of echoes or movement of the fluid, of the fluid collections. And mind you, if you do this, make sure that you use ample amount of gel because in these cases, patient would really be in pain if you do too much of the transducer compression. So just be gentle on the patient. So that's already a giveaway. If the patient is in so much pain, you know that it's already a full-blown inflammatory process. And then within that collection of fluid, you can also see gas bubbles appearing as hyperechoic comet tail foci. For you to easily identify it, they usually tell me residents that it actually looks like sperm-like swimming within this anechoic fluid collections. And on color Doppler, synovial hyperemic flow pattern of hypertrophied synovium and paraarticular tissues are appreciated. So depending on its nature, non-infected, non-hemorrhagic joint effusion can be completely anechoic with absence of internal echoes. So usually if it's non-infected, it's just plain capsular distension, then it's usually a clean anechoic. It's just black without those hyperechoic sperm-like comet tail fossil or it may contain scattered echogenic spots as the result of proteinaceous content, fibrin, crystals, or cellular debris. So demonstration of an intraarticular effusion affecting a single joint is a definitive indication for sampling, analysis, and cultural procedures in order to rule out 
microcrystal arthritis and infection. Okay, so now what happens now? What now, what now would you consider if the distension of a joint recess is not an echoic? If it's purely black, it's clean, no hyperechoic, comet tail, sperm like looking foci, then you're dealing now with something of an infection if it's not clean black at all so it could either be so if the joint recess is not an echoic it's not clear black so it could either be just complex fluid or synovial hypertrophy so it's very important that you differentiate what is complex fluid and what is just a pure synovial hypertrophy so bear in mind complex fluid is very much compressible this is the one that would show swirling of echoes. I'll show you later on towards the end of the lecture videos of sonopalpation or transducer compression that results in swirling of echoes, swirling of those fluid collections. And because of the transducer compression, it leads to redistribution of the contents with also with movement of the joints. But in most cases, patient will be in severe pain. We cannot actually move the joint. So what we do, to find out if it's compressible, it's just we just do minimal transducer compression. Okay, and sometimes there is lack of internal flow on collar Doppler. Now, in contrast, synovial hypertrophy is not compressible. So no matter how much you compress your transducer, you won't see any changes. You won't see any swirling of echoes. You won't see any movements of debris or anechoic fluid. And for synovitis, that's very much active. Definitely, you would see neovascularization, hypervascularization on color Doppler imaging. So always make use of your color Doppler. So when synovial hypertrophy related to a septic joint is present, there's also discontinuity or irregularity of the adjacent bone cortex that suggests erosion and possible osteomyelitis. So to help you identify also these cases, okay, before we go to sonographic appearance, let me just um, emphasize that we do not just rely on sonographic findings at all. We need to have a good history and we need to do a good physical examination. And most importantly, we need to extract the correct mechanism of injury. And all of that combined, you get a full history, a reliable history, a complete physical examination, and an honest mechanism of action, a mechanism of injury, together with your sonographic findings, then most likely you would come up with a correct diagnosis. So do not just rely on just sonographic findings because you will see, you will find out that most joint effusion would just look the same and most synovial hypertrophy would also look the same whether they're infected or not infected so have a complete and thorough examination history and mechanism of injury and then you go for your sonographic findings and there most likely you will not get it wrong okay so this one is our patient it's an 18 month old with a history of fall. And then immediately after the fall, after the parents found out that he had a fall, the patient was brought to a manual, uh, to a traditional helo. And then manual manipulation was did on the left lower extremity, more specifically the knee. So in here, you would see that this is the growth plate, okay? And you can already see it's not unechoic as this one so there's already beginning thickening and this is the quadriceps tendon this is the femur and you have here the growth plates so the quadriceps tendon you can still see you can still appreciate it as a hyperechoic fibrillar pattern so you have the subcutaneous layer it's normal it doesn't have the cobblestone appearance or the intervening unechoic fluid channels but look at the joint it is beginning to have thickening. See that one? It's beginning to have thickening, whereas this one is still an echoic, but this one is becoming hypoechoic. 
this is still the same patient. And in color Doppler, you would see lining the thickened synovium. There's already hypervascularization. In this one, you could already see cortical changes or what we call subperiostal reaction. So there's already sonographic evidence of beginning osteomyelitis and the patient is only 18 months old. Okay, and here, this is still the same patient. So I just moved the transducer more proximal and this is now seeing here more hypervascularization. And in here, you already have loss of the normal muscle ecotexture. You don't see the normal muscles of the quadriceps anymore. And it's just really hypervascular. Okay. So again, the history of this, there's no open wound, there's no fracture, but massage was done by a traditional helot. So just take note, look at that hypoechogenicity. You don't appreciate any penny pattern or fibular pattern for tendons and penny pandemic muscles. It's just all hazy and looks dirty. Okay, now this is still the same patient. This is now on the anterior knee. So you can see there's still an unechoic fluid. Okay, so this one would still be compressible, but if it is replaced by this hypoechogenicity and you don't see any unechogenicity like this anymore, then that would not be compressible anymore. But this one, it's still appreciative. You can still appreciate minimal compressibility of the fluid because it is not filled up with this thickened synovium. Okay, so this one, I'm just gonna show you, this is still the same patient. So in this picture, there is no compression, but you can see there's lots of hypervascularity. Okay, and this is now inside the suprapatellar bursa. And this one, look at the compression. You have moved out of the fluid. And this is where it is. You have the same media in here. So this is not compression. Or this is without compression. You can still see the fluid. It's more and it's more. And with compression, you have movements of the fluid pushed out the fluid, so that's why you see less of this unechogenicity and it is replaced with this hypoechoic infection and you have thickening, hyperechoic appearance of the synovium. So this is now the suprapatellar bursa of this patient. So this is now the panoramic view. This is from medial to lateral. It's a short axis view of the suprapatellar bursa. You can appreciate here that is now the complex fluid. And you have now thickening, thickening of the synovial lining. And over here, you have cortical changes. And in close up, you would appreciate subperiostal reaction as a beginning sign of osteomyelitis. So imaging of the pediatric joint effusions. So usually pediatric patient presents with hip pain, limp, unable to wait there. They may have fever or without fever. It depends if they have a very strong and good immune system. Septic arthritis is an important diagnosis to identify and exclude as it is a surgical emergency emergency due to its rapidly progressive and destructive course. So as I've been mentioning earlier, the reason why you get start referral from the emergency orthopedic residents, it's because they need to decide based on our findings on the ultrasound of whether first would they admit the patient or not? Would they send home the patient or the patient would be admitted? Do they need to do an emergency arthrotomy or not? So that's why it's very important that we identify if the infection is already into the joint or it is not yet in the joint. So it matters a lot in an emergency setting in terms of treatment planning for this pediatric patient. So the presentation of septic arthritis in pediatric joint effusion would be fever, but there are some patients that will not present fever early in the disease. 
there will be an elevated WPC, leukocytosis, elevated CRP, and elevated ESR. So I'm showing you again a picture. Okay, this is an infected hip. So this is the femoral head. You can see this is the good hip. This is the epiphyseal plate, the growth plate. You can see here. So this is the femoral head. This is the femoral neck. So for the right, you can see it's not distended. But here, look at the capsule. It's distended already. And there's already a fluid. You can appreciate a hypo to an echoic fluid. Okay, so another example still on the femur. Again, the growth plate, femoral head, femoral neck. So this is how you would measure the capsule distension, the capsular distension, and you have your iliopsoas muscles over here. You can notice the subcutaneous layer is still normal. The muscles over here would still be having the normal echo texture. Here, this is a very obvious convexity of the hip capsule. Normally, the hip capsule would be concave. So just be very thin, concave. So in this pediatric left hip capsule, you can see that there's convexity. So that is already the extension of the hip capsule. And this is definitely more than 10 millimeter. So now we go first to the normal ultrasound anatomy of the hip joint. So for the pediatric hip, bear in mind that the anterior joint capsule mainly composed of fibrous tissue with only a thin layer of synovial membrane. And then you have your anterior layer and you have the posterior layer. So according to the European Society of Musculoskeletal Radiology, a small amount of physiologic joint fluid is considered normal in pediatric hip. But a thickness of two millimeter is taken as threshold for differentiating between physiologic and pathologic effusion. And if there is a symmetry of more than two millimeters in the anterior synovial recess depth in bilateral hips, then joint effusion should be interpreted. And according to Chow and Griffith from the Royal College of Radiologists, distance between the cortex of femoral neck and outer margin of the hip capsule should not be more than five millimeters or two millimeters thicker than the contralateral side. So anatomy of the hip joint, there should be an unechoic joint space. It should be concave, not convex. And it's just a thin line of anechoic joint space. So the anterior recess is collapsed and two layers of the joint capsule are opposed against each other, which results in a linear reflection, which we call now the stripe sign. So according to John Jacobson, when do we consider joint effusion in ultrasound? For the pediatric hip, if there is more than two millimeters of separation of the anterior and posterior capsule layers, over the anterior femoral neck. And for the adult hip, total capsular distension of seven millimeter measured from the anterior femoral neck surface to the outer margin of the capsule to include both an anterior and posterior layers would already be considered as joint effusion. And also if there is a more than one millimeter asymmetry compared with the asymptomatic contralateral hip. So do not forget always check the contralateral joint. So according from, uh, to Chow and Griffith, adult hip, if the thickness of more than nine mm or more than two millimeter thicker than the, contra -norma, than the contralateral normal hip, then joint effusion is considered because this is already abnormal. So just take note of the small difference between Chow and Griffith. So with uh, Chow and Griffith between John Jacobson. So John Jacobson, it's seven millimeter, but with an asymmetry of more than one millimeter. But in Chow and Griffith, it's a thickness of nine millimeter or more than two millimeter thicker compared to the contralateral normal hip. 
this is another picture of comparison of the same patient. So here, the left hip is normal. You see the concavity? But look at the right hip. There's an unechoic distension of the hip capsule. So if you will measure this one, this would be more than 10 millimeter. So over here, this is the acetabulum, and then you have your femoral neck here, the femoral head. This is one millimeter. This is 10 millimeter. So this is the contralateral side. This is the left, and this is the right. You can see the muscles are not affected. So it's only the hip, because in here, you would still have the normal penne pattern of the muscles of the anterior hip. So you can still appreciate the penne pattern. Okay, now this picture, this is very obvious, this is septic hip joint. So this is a patient that Ed did during this um, CQ. I think this is during, I need to drink water first. My throat is drying up. I think Ed did this just this month, this June. So you can see here, you can appreciate cortical destruction. This is an adult hip, okay? You cannot appreciate the femoral head anymore. Okay, the acetabulum is also disrupted. So you have a lot of subperiostral reaction going on in the bone. This is already sonographic evidence of osteomyelitis. And look at that hip capsule distension. This is on the same hip. Okay, so just take note. Look at the good bone cortex. It's a straight, hyperechoic line, smooth, without cortical irregularities. But look at the femoral head. You cannot identify it anymore. It doesn't have that convex shape, that rounded shape of the femoral head, and neither does the acetabulum. So you have here subperiostral reaction already. And with this sonographic findings, this one is also appreciated now in, ultras in a plain radiograph. Okay, so this is the same patient. You can see how distended the hip is. And this is on her contralateral hip. So you have there okay, a concave hip capsule. This is a uh, female patient. Okay, this is still the same patient. So the patient actually has a draining sinus. So this is on a long axis view, superior to the wound, to the draining sinus. And this one goes straight up. Okay, this is on the anterior thigh. And if you trace this, it goes all the way back to the hip joint. And this is her hip joint. So here you can trace it. This draining sinus has penetrated through the muscle, through the subcutaneous layer, through the epidermis, the dermis, and it goes out. That's why there is an obvious draining sinus on examination of the thigh. This one now is a different patient. You can see the measurement here. It's 12.7 millimeter, and you do not appreciate the concave shape of the capsule, but rather it is more of a convex. And you can see here, this is not a smooth or a thin hyperechoic cortex, but you would also have cortical changes already over here. See, so you have there that hyperechoic cortical changes, but it's just in the beginning stage. So if you compare it with the femoral shaft and here on the femoral head, you can see this minor cortical changes. So if this is left untreated, then it will lead to a full-blown osteomyelitis. So you have to be very keen in looking at the subtle signs of cortical irregularities. But you can appreciate the muscles would still have the normal echo texture. 
Okay, so now we also have to bear in mind the limitation of our machine, of the ultrasound. Ultrasound can yeah, differentiate between neither joint recess echogenicity nor flow and color or power Doppler imaging can distinguish between aseptic and septic effusion. So it's difficult to appreciate a small joint effusion in patients with increased soft tissues superficial to the hip and in those with large body habitus. So remember, ultrasound-guided percutaneous aspiration is more accurate for diagnosis of septic arthritis and should also be considered in any effusion if there is concern for infection. So even if we've been doing this for several years in Philippine Orthopedic Center, I'm still very, very careful and very conservative in really writing out in my report that I am 100% sure that this is septic arthritis because septic arthritis could present in similar ways with a non-septic joint. So I would still not give a definitive conclusion, but rather a suggestion that they could use ultrasound as an ultrasound guided technique as a therapeutic tool and diagnostic tool. But be careful in writing in your report that you are definite that this is really a septic arthritis because laboratory um, tests would still be more important. And it's still needed. Again, do not forget, you still need to have a complete history, physical examination, the mechanism of injury. So all of those together with your sonographic findings and laboratory findings, then you will make the correct diagnosis and appropriate treatment for your patient. So Okay, let me continue. So although ultrasound is highly sensitive in detecting intraarticular fluid, it cannot definitively differentiate among different types of effusions. Okay, so now let's go to cellulitis. So cellulitis. Are we good? May I continue? Okay. Yes, go ahead, okay. <laughs> so now we go to cellulitis. I'm sure you've seen cellulitis. This is one of the most common that we see, not just in the hospital setting, but also in our clinics as well. So it's spreading of inflammatory reaction occurring along subcutaneous layer, fascial planes with edema and hyperemia. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a most common form of musculoskeletal infection in practice, whether hospital setting or clinic setting. And I see a lot of this in medical missions. But unfortunately, I don't get to bring my ultrasound machine during medical missions because it's so tedious. And there's going to be a lot of patients lining up already if I would do an ultrasound one by one. Of course, as physicians, we still need to have that good clinical eye. And rely on our physical examination when we go to medical missions. So the most common pathogen would be strep or staph. And predisposing factors would be stasis, no movement, immobilization. I hope none of our patients had cellulitis because of the ECQ, because of not moving at all, a sedentary lifestyle that was caused by the ECQ. And if ever we get patients like that, I'm sure they would tell me they would blame it to the ECQ and the government did not allow them to go out. Okay, so much for that. Poor general health is also a predisposing factor. Skin laceration or ulceration, venipuncture, eczema, immunosuppression. And I just did not include it in my slide, but do not be surprised. I get cases of cellulitis status post vaccine injection in both pediatrics and adult. So I have already uh, treated patients having cellulitis as a reaction after their vaccine, both pedia and the parents who had the flu vaccine and the pneumonia vaccine. So be careful when you give your vaccination. So what is now the ultrasound appearance 
of cellulitis. There's definitely subcutaneous thickening. There's diffuse swelling. So when you say subcutaneous thickening, so usually a normal subcutaneous layer would be more of a hypoechoic with hyperechoic connective tissue septa. But in cellulitis, this hypoechogenicity increases its echogenicity. So there's diffuse swelling. The architecture of the subcutaneous is all distorted, appears more hyperechoic. And in the early stage, sometimes you do not appreciate the cobblestone appearance. What you can appreciate is the increasing echogenicity of the subcutaneous layer, but you still cannot identify the cobblestone. So that's still in the early stage of cellulitis. Though the skin may already be warm, but during the early stage, the skin is warm, but it's, it doesn't still look shiny. But in the later stages, the skin would be warm and it's already shiny and it looks full. So in the late stage or the severe stage, there's definitely obvious cobblestoning with intervening anechoic fluid channels signifying lymph edema. Okay, so this is a picture of the right lateral thigh. So you can see here, you already have cobblestoning. You can already appreciate it. And here, there is already beginning. Can you see this? Hypo to unechoic fluid channels. Okay, so if this doesn't get treated, it's gonna become a full-blown lymph edema and your lobulated cobblestones would be dispersed and you would have now an obvious intervening unechoic channels. Okay, if you can see here, the muscles underneath it is not yet affected. So you can still see the normal muscle echo texture of the muscles of the thigh. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, cellulitis or ultrasound would have increased echogenicity of the skin and the subcutaneous tissues. So there's cobblestone appearance. But depending on the amount of the perifacial fluid, degree of subcutaneous edema, an orientation of the interlobular fat septa. So these grayscale appearances are not in themselves diagnostic of cellulitis as similar appearances occur in subcutaneous edema resulting from non-infective conditions such as your venous insufficiency or cardiac failure. So again, we cannot just rely purely on sonographic findings, on what we see on our ultrasound screen. Always take note, I will always emphasize this one, take a good history, physical examination, so that it will help you come up with a correct diagnosis. So be careful because not all cellulitis would be infectious. It could be just an edema from venous insufficiency or a cardiac failure. So you need to know how to differentiate it. Okay, so this one, you can see an obvious intervening anechoic fluid channels as the previous picture that I showed you. So here, so these fat lobules in the subcutaneous layer, the cobblestone, are now wildly, widely apart. And you now have obvious intervening anechoic fluid channels. In between, these fluid channels travel through the connective tissue septa of the connective tissue layer, of the subcutaneous layer, okay? Here, this is our patient last Friday. This patient has a massive cellulitis from the knee down to the dorsum of his foot. And this picture is taken on the anterior ankle joint. So this is the fibula, this is the tibia, this is on short axis view. So the patient has a history of neglected fracture of the distal femur brought to a different center prior to Philippine Orthopedic Center, placed on a um, posterior mold, but the parents decided to leave the hospital. I mean, they signed a waiver, so they went home against medical advice and no more treatment was done to the patient until Recently, they brought the patient last June 15 to Philippine Orthopedic Center, and now he is admitted. So you can see this cobblestoning and this hyperechoic layer of the subcutaneous and deep to the subcutaneous layer. You have now 
this unequoic, okay? intervening unequoic fluid channel, signs of lymph edema. And you can also appreciate if there's a fluid above, you can appreciate your posterior acoustic enhancement. So this is still the same patient, another review. So you would have here, see that posterior acoustic enhancement, posterior acoustic enhancement. So you can see this lymph edema and you can see those cobblestone appearance of the subcutaneous layer. And you already have thickening okay, of the skin layer. It's more hyperechoic because normally with the ultrasound that we use for musculoskeletal, we can we cannot identify the dermis and the epidermis, but in a severe form of cellulitis with lymph edema, you can actually appreciate the thickening of the dermis. Okay, still the same patient. This is now more proximal to the anterior ankle joint. So you can just see how massive the cellulitis is. So from the dorsum of the foot to the ankle, anterior ankle joint, going up now to the syndesmosis of the tibia and the fibula, you can still appreciate this unechoic okay, intervening fluid channels that signifies lymph edema. So what's happening now to this patient, he has cellulitis. At the same time, he is also presenting with lymph edema. And this one goes all the way up to the knee and up. The cellulitis ends at the knee joint, but from the knee joint going up to the iliopsoas, it's all infection again, pyomyositis with abscess. I'm going to show you other pictures of him later. Okay, so cellulitis versus edema in sonographic findings. Increased echogenicity and hypervascularity and color flow is seen in cellulitis than in edema. So remember, hyperemia is not a feature of non-infected forms of edema. Color or power Doppler within the subcutaneous tissue is helpful in establishing an inflammatory element. Now we go to infective bursitis. So this is common, but usually not infective, especially for patients who, who like to um, lean on their elbow on a hard surface, and it leads to a uh, distended olecranon bursa, but not necessarily an infected olecranon bursa. So bursitis usually comprise a steroid inflammation of the bursal wall as a result of chronic repetitive trauma or undue stress. So that's why it's very common on the, um, on the elbow, on the olecranon bursa. And it's also common for those, maybe those who kneel a lot, those who are religious and maybe due to work, that they need to kneel on a hard surface without any cushioning. So it can happen also to their superficial subcutaneous prepatellar bursa. Ultrasound appearance of infective bursitis. So there is peribursal edema. There's bursal wall thickening. There's this tension by an echoic fluid or gelatinous material or mixed echogenicity. So how, how again would you distinguish if it's more of a gelatinous or just a plain fluid. So if it's a plain fluid, it's easily compressible on transducer compression. But it's, if it is gelatinous, such as a um, ganglion cyst, then it is minimally compressible or not compressible at all. And occasionally there is internal hyperechoic debris and hyperechoic calcification. So color Doppler may reveal bursal wall hyperemia. And that's already a sonographic evidence of infective bursitis. Okay, but again, remember, infective bursitis are considered identical to those of a chronic inflammatory non-infective bursitis. So again, you need a thorough history, physical examination, and a lengthy past medical history. Okay, so this is a picture of the very big subacromial, subbursal distension. So clearly here, it is a clean, non-infected, subacromial, subdeltoid bursal distension of the shoulder. Okay. So you can see here, it's anechoic. You don't see those comet tail foci or what I call the sperm-like 
swimming particles within here. This is highly compressible on transducer compression. It's not painful for the patient. And when you do the transducer compression, you can actually move out all the fluid because there is no abscess, there's no infection, there's no pyomyositis in it. So it's a clean fluid and it's just easily to aspirate this one. I actually have a patient, a male patient, who's been coming to me for ultrasound guided acrocentesis of his SASD bursal distension. And he does it like for the past two years. He has a full rotator tendon cuff tear. He is already 68 years old, but I believe he's still very strong. He, does, he doesn't have a lot of comorbidities besides hypertension. So I've been telling him we need to do something about the full thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon, the subscapularis tendon, and partially the infraspinatus tendon. But I couldn't get him to, to agree with further treatment because he said he's still okay. He can still move his shoulder, full range of motion. And he just goes to my clinic to see me like every four months or five months when he feels that that particular SASD bursa is already heavy. He knows that it's already filled with fluid. And the largest amount of fluid that I was able to aspirate, it's a clear joint fluid, was um, 80 ml. 80 ml. So that's, you know, but usually I would just be able to aspirate around 30 ml. But the biggest amount of fluid that I aspirated in this particular patient was 80 ml. But until now, he still wouldn't agree that he needs further treatment for the torn rotator cuff tendons. Okay, this is another patient of mine. This is a female, 80 year old with an end stage renal disease, undergoes dialysis three times a week, even during the lockdown, and he, she feels safe in Medical City having her dialysis there. So clearly, you can see. It's a suprapatellar bursal distension. It's non-infective. It's very clean. It's all anechoic. You can appreciate the short axis view of the quadriceps tendon. Oops, sorry. Okay. And this is the femur and short axis view. And there is no hyperechoic comital fossae or your hyperechoic debris, your sperm-like swimming cells in here. So it's clean. So this one, when I aspirated this patient, you'd be surprised. I consumed 12 10 cc syringes. So it's 12 10 cc syringes and she took a video of all of it and she took a picture. It's a clean fluid actually. So I talked to her nephrologist and the nephrologist told me no need to send for laboratory for the fluid. Okay, so now this is different. This is a suprapatellar bursa, but you can see it's not clean anymore. So this is an infective suprapatellar bursa. You can see this one, this debris, this hypoechoic within this anechoic fluid. So now I will call it a complex fluid. And in here, this patient actually has also a pyomyositis of the quadriceps muscles affecting the intermedials the vastus medialis and the vastus lateralis. And on the suprapatellar bursa, you can see as compared to my previous patient, the one with a kidney problem, it is not an echoic. It's hypo to hyperechoic with areas of abscess formation deep in the muscles. So here, this is still the same patient. Okay, if you ask me on transducer compression, because you can still see some form of anechogenicity to hypoechogenicity, this is still compressible on sonopalpation. But over here, it's only minimally compressible. You can see there's only minimal anechogenicity in this area. So it's all abscess and it's minimally compressible as compared to this area wherein you could really see a um, movement of the fluid when you do your sonopalpation. So this is another patient with infective bursitis. Again, short axis view of the suprapatellar bursa. And you can see hypervascularity on colored Doppler. 
And you can see here, cortical irregularities. So there's already beginning signs of cortical or subperiostal reaction of the bone. So again, if left untreated, this is now gonna be a full-blown osteomyelitis. So take note of this cortical irregularities, your subperiostal reaction and the suprapatellar bursa. It's hypoechoic with hyperechoic debris and hypervascularity on color doppler. Okay, this one is the same pediatric patient that I mentioned you earlier with the cellulitis and lymphedema in the ankle joint and the knee. So this is the beginning of the cellulitis proximally. So this is the superficial subcutaneous prepatellar bursa, and it's also infected. See this one? This is the patellar tendon. It's hyperechoic, fibrillar in pattern on long axis view. This is the Hoffa's fat pad. And you can see the bone, the patella. And if you've noticed because of the fluid in here of the cellulitis, this is more intensely hyperechoic. Over here, you can also see an intensely hyperechoic area. This one, because of this unechoic fluid from the cellulitis, it now results in a posterior acoustic enhancement leading now to this intensely hyperechogenicity of the patella and underneath the patella tendon and going into the Hoffa's fat pad. So you call this your posterior acoustic enhancement. Again, this would tell you, this is a sonographic sign that when you see a posterior acoustic enhancement, then you would suspect that there must be a fluid above it. Because for you to get a posterior acoustic enhancement, then there is some unechogenicity immediately above that area or overlying that area. Okay, so this one, I saw this paper from the, from the 1999 publication of musculoskeletal infections, ultrasound manifestation. So this is on the olecranon bursitis. They did an aspiration and lavage of this patient, and the result of the laboratory was staph arius. So this is a paper done in United Kingdom. And in that paper, what is peculiar is that they said that it was only in 1998 that United Kingdom began to appreciate infections uh, such as pyomyositis with the use of ultrasound. It was only in 1998 and septic arthritis and infectious bursitis with the use of ultrasound. Okay, now we go to infective tenosynovitis. So most commonly, the result of penetrating trauma predominantly affects the hand and wrist. Flexor tendons are more commonly affected. The flexor tendon sheets of the thumb and the little finger communicate respectively with the radial and ulnar bursa. So always bear that in mind. Anatomy. Okay, so the six discrete extensor tendon synovial sheets neither communicate with each other or the flexor tendons. But it is only the flexor tendons that communicate okay, with the radial and the ulnar bursa. So the ultrasound appearance of infective tenosynovitis, there's variable thickening of the tendon sheet with hyperemia again seen on color Doppler. Occasionally, hyperemia is also seen within the substance of the tendon. The tendon sheet thickening is usually hypoechoic and it may resemble viscous fluid. So if you have viscous fluid, then you would expect that it will just be minimally compressible on sono compression or sono palpation. So on color Doppler, different shape synovial sheet thickening with hyperemia from a synovial sheet effusion that has no hypervascularization on color Doppler. So this important distinction in order to consider immediate diagnostic aspiration and send for culture and sensitivity. So this may influence decision-making as to whether urgent surgery should be undertaken. So always make use of your color Doppler. Okay, so this is again from the same publication on musculoskeletal infections, ultrasound manifestation. This is an extender tendon sheet 
See this one? This is a comet tail. This is already a gas forming. So you would know that there's already bacteria, there's a pathogen. And this is the distended extensor tendon sheet. And after aspiration, the aspiration yielded only 0.5 ml of fluid. They did a lavage and then they aspirated it again and sent it for culture. And this is now after the aspiration. So you can see there the thicken, thickening of the synovium, the tendon sheath, and the synovial sheath. See, even without the fluid, they aspirated it already. You can still see that it's still not an echoic. It's usually a normal tendon sheet will just be really a thin line, a thin and echoic line. But if it's infectious, you would see that it's hazy, it's dirty, it's hypoechoic, and it's thickened. But the tendon, look at the tendon. It remains normal. It's intact. It has a normal fibrillar pattern on long axis view. But by virtue of the anechoic fluid over here, it gives a posterior acoustic enhancement. And here, there's still an appreciative a posterior acoustic enhancement, but not as much as this one prior to the aspiration. Okay, this one is an ECU tenosynovitis. Again, if this is a clean tendon sheet distension, it will just be plain anechoic, it will be black, and you will not see this hypoechoic material, the thickening of the synovial sheet, the tendon sheet. Okay, so it's very thickened. This is on short axis view of the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. And there's some form of fluid, so that's why you can appreciate again, posterior acoustic enhancement, posterior to the fluid. Okay, now let's deal with pyomyositis. It is a suppurative bacterial infection of muscle, most prevalent in the tropics and immunocompromised patients. But um, in the research that I've read in the papers in UK and United States, they started identifying pyomyositis in temperate climates back in 1998. But I guess in the Philippines, we've had pyomyositis ever since I wasn't even born. We already had pyomyositis here. Okay, precipitating factors. Muscle trauma from manual manipulation, what we call the traditional helot here in our country. Muscle trauma from acute injury, followed again by a heat or a massage hematoma, or a minor blunt trauma. So the major calcitive agent could be staph aureus, mycobacterium, tuberculosis, and strep. So clinical manifestations, it could present with or without fever. Usually in the early stages, patients will not present with fever. And if they have a strong immune system, all the more that they would not present fever early in the stage. There's dull, cramping pain for 10 to 21 days and a localized muscle tenderness. And when they walk, there's usually a limp that involves the lower extremity. Okay, now we go to the stages of pyomyositis as we see it on sonographic findings. First is the early invasive inflammatory stage. So this is with pain, swelling of the involved muscle with or without fever. Next to that stage is the suppurative stage. This now occurs between 10 to 21 days after onset. And there is now an ultrasound abscess formation. Fever and malaise are commonly noted. Possible to palpate a fluctuant muscle, and it's the patient who will actually guide you where she or he can palpate that fluctuant muscle. And there is marked mucocytosis and elevated ESR. And 90% of patients will present to our center during this suppurative stage. And the third stage is septicemia. It now results in an associate, it is now associated with multiple metastatic abscess. So again, just a review, the ultrasound appearance of pyomyositis for the early invasive inflammatory phase, you have muscle swelling, diffuse hyperechoic appearance reflecting edema and hyperemia. You have a small hyperechoic foci within the abnormal muscle related to necrosis and small abscess may be noted and loss of the normal muscle ecotexture is just beginning. So sometimes if it's a big muscle, like adductor muscles or the quadriceps muscle, gastrox muscles, you can still appreciate normal ecotexture. But in some areas, there's already beginning to, um, uh, to be um, replaced by the abscess or by the pyomyositis. 
But since it's a huge muscle, it takes time for the infection to really involve the entire muscle. So the, for the suppurative phase, later in the course of the disease, this is an overt muscle abscess. Okay, now, this is an example of a thigh muscle. This is involving now the vastus intermedius. And it is, this is the muscle close to the femur. This is an example of a suppurative stage. So if you can see the muscles above it, you still have the normal equitexture of a muscle. Okay? So you still have the starry, starry night appearance or your steak cut appearance of the quadriceps muscles. But the deep muscles of the quadriceps, look at it. It's diffuse. You completely lost the normal muscle equitexture. You can neither identify it as stay cut appearance or starry starry night appearance. It's just, it has coalesced already into a hypoechoic substance to hyperechoic substance with areas of fluid. Okay? That is why you can see the femur shows a bit of a posterior acoustic enhancement. Okay, this is another example. This is again deep into the muscle. This is your biceps femoris. The superficially of the biceps femoris is spared. You can see on long axis view, you have the normal hyperechoic 10A pattern of the biceps femoris, but deep into the muscles, see this one, the pyomyositis. It has replaced the normal equitexture of the hamstring muscles. Okay, this one is another example. This is the femur, short axis view of the vastus intermedius. You can appreciate the normal muscles of the other quadriceps, but look at the vastus intermedius. It has lost its normal muscle equitexture and it has fluid surrounding it. Okay, this is another example of pyomyositis in the adductor muscles. So you can see the semitendinosus, it's normal, long axis view. Semimembranosis, it's also normal on long axis view, but look at the magnus. You cannot appreciate any lines, any pattern at all. It is replaced by this hypoechoic infection. And there's again fluid over here. So once you see this fluid, I would expect that there's still some form of movement when I do transducer compression. This one is on the upper back. Okay? This is on the trapecius. So you can see over, this is the same patient, but it's just a different view. There's already beginning abscess formation. You have pyomyositis. And in here, you can still appreciate a bit of the trapecius muscle. The supraspinatus muscle is still not affected. You still have the normal muscle equitexture of the supraspinatus muscle. But look at the trapecius. There's already complex fluid forming now into abscess and you have pyomyositis surrounding it and on color doppler it's actually positive there's hypervascularity on color doppler okay so this one is another view you can see here the trapecius it has completely lost its normal muscle echotexture and replaced by the pyomyositis okay this one is a recent scanning done by ed this patient was referred because of a palpable flactuant mass on the lateral hip, the area of the greater trochanter. Patient is status post, total hip arthroplasty. And on sonographic findings, there is a peri-implant infection. So you can see here, this is the implant. And this is the bone of the patient. So you can see the bone is also not smooth. And there's hypervascularity on color Doppler. So the bone also has some form of cortical irregularities, and these are sonographic evidence of osteomyelitis. Okay, so you can see this is the implant with your reverberation from the implant. And this is that area near the greater trochanter, long axis view over that flat one mass. So you can see here, there's already loss of the normal muscle equitexture of the lateral thigh. This is the one that the patient points that is fluctuant and painful on palpation. So you can see here, this is a normal muscle echotexture, but this one, this is already infection. That one is infection. And remember, it goes all the way to the THA area, to the hip joint. 
So that's why we signed this out as peri-implant infection. Okay, this is the same patient. You can see on short axis view, you have hypervascularity on color Doppler. So there's complex fluid, there's abscess formation, and it is slightly compressible on sonopalpation. So this is the implant. You would notice because it's very smooth white line, different from the bone. Okay, this one is an example of a hip adductor pyomyositis on an invasive stage. This is the beginning stage, the inflammatory stage, because you can still see, you can still appreciate some form of mus normal muscle ecotexture. This is the adductor muscles, and this surrounding it would be the normal adductor muscles. And this one is the affected adductor muscle that is in the infected inflammatory stage of pyomyositis. So it's just beginning. Okay? It's just beginning as compared to the suppurative stage. And this is on short axis view. So you can still see here your starry starry night pattern, but this one, you don't appreciate the starry night pattern on short axis view. So now we go to abscess formation because usually when you have severe cases of pyomyositis, most likely there's also an abscess formation. So it's a localized collection of necrotic tissue, bacteria, inflammatory exudates, and polymorphs. So most commonly occur within muscle or subcutaneous tissue. So it is irregular, but fairly defined border on ultrasound. There's a fluid collection that can be heterogeneous. Its echogenicity can be similar to the surrounding soft tissues. And it is compressible and transducer compression or sonopalpation because of the fluid. So what is now the muscle abscess appearance on ultrasound? Again, as I mentioned earlier, it is heterogeneous fluid collections with well-defined posterior acoustic enhancement and variable echo texture. The posterior acoustic enhancement is because of the fluid collections. It ranges from anechoic to hypoechoic, and sometimes it could be hyperechoic because of the debris. And the gas bubbles is present. They are the hyperechoic on the tail. And it will tell you that there's already presence of gas forming organisms. And on color Doppler, there is hyperemia. Okay, I'm just going to show you on the examples of abscess formation. So you can see this one, fluid collections deep into the muscle. And this is highly compressible on sono palpation. And you can actually express out the fluid. You can shift out the fluid once you do your sono palpation. Again, similar picture here of that abscess formation. And this is where the pyomyositis of the muscle, this is the femur, this is on the thigh. So here, look at here, you can still see it. You can appreciate the short axis view of the muscle, but here you have beginning, you have already pyomyositis over this area. And deep to that muscle, it's anechoic, you have fluid collection, it's already abscess formation. So just be mindful, you still have this normal muscle echo texture beside this infection. So threshold for aspiration should be low, particularly as muscle abscess may appear quite solid with no clearly discernible fluid, yet still yield pus on aspiration. But you need to use a very large bore needle to be able to aspirate this. Otherwise, it will not come out and you need incision and drainage. Okay, so these are just examples again. Okay, this one. Okay, so putative stage, pyomyositis with abscess, so putative stage. This one is a metallic fixation of the right femur. This is the metallic fixation, and you have your infection. This one is a uh, short axis view of the distal tibia. You can see here, you can note this is a periostal, subperiostal reaction. It's already sign of osteomyelitis. And these are all complex fluid, cometal appearance, what we call sperm like appearance. Okay, so our son et al. reported that 19 out of 21 soft tissue abscess displayed wall hyperemia apparent on color Doppler imaging. While Bredal et al. found hyperemia to be a feature of inflammatory rather than non-inflammatory collection. So again, always use your color Doppler, okay? Okay, so my other slides. This is a 12-year-old male, distal third femur fracture, last April 2020, and you can see abscess. You have all this comet tail This is the fracture site. 
and see here the fracture site, it's thickening. You have cortical thickening. And this is already very subperiosteal reaction. Again, sign of osteomyelitis and ultrasound. Okay. And look at this, this is highly compressible on sonopalpation. This is the fracture site of the distal femur. Just gonna show you. See that? The swirling of echoes, the movement. Okay. Also, this one. This is above the inguinal ligament. This is involving the iliopsoas muscle. It's highly compressible. Look at those cometal debris, hyperechoic. Totally, you don't appreciate the iliopsoas muscle echotexture. So, this is vastus medialis. Again, completely, I do not appreciate the vastus medialis muscle anymore. It's replaced by all abscess, pyomyositis with this comet tail appearance debris. Okay, this is now on the hip. This is the normal hip, okay? You can see here, there's already an infection, but you can see the hip capsule is not yet distended. This was a recent referral to us. So we discussed this with a, DI, with a doctor in charge in the pediatric orthopedic. And then we told them that they really need an emergency treatment for this patient because they can still save the hip joint. See the hip capsule, it's still concave, it's not convex, it's not yet distended, but look at the abscess. It's very close to that and it's just really sitting on top of the hip capsule. So the patient is already admitted. So this one, the result of this one is actually um, tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And you can see also it penetrates through the skin. There's already an injuration. This one is a shoulder scapula, pyomyositis with abscess. You can see here, complete loss of the muscle echotexture, the normal muscle echotexture. And this is a video of that, the same patient. It's highly compressible. And as I told you, there's already septation. If there's septation, it's already a severe stage. Okay, this is towards the end of my lecture now. I'm just going to show you to differentiate between a solid mass and an abscess formation like this one. So in solid mass, you cannot actually compress the mass. Okay? And usually the hypervascularity comes from the middle of this one as compared to the periphery in infections. So if it's a solid mass, if you're dealing with a solid mass, then the hypervascularity of this would come out from the middle and it is not compressible. So the, prior to the ultrasound, the patient already had a CT scan and we saw the same thing in the ultrasound. So this is again a patient of Ed. So this is just massive. And this is the patient we're in. He did the ultrasound guided needle, needle biopsy last Wednesday. Okay, so here you can see he's actually compressing it. I'm the one videoing it on my cell phone, but you won't see any changes and you don't see any movement of the fluid. There's no fluid going out because it's a solid mass. And this is actually the area where Ed did the needle biopsy. And he actually got like six tissue biopsy. Okay, this is now the needle biopsy that Ed did last Wednesday. So this is the needle going into that mass. And we're going to send this. So this is actually a referral. The referral to our musculoskeletal section was actually for ultrasound guided needle biopsy since they already have the CT scan result. So they just wanted us to do the needle biopsy ultrasound guided. Okay. So again, you can see because Ed did it six times. I, I guess, yeah, he got six tissue samples. So this is another entry point. Okay. And these are just some pictures of seroma. This is a patient of mine, status post plating with screw fixation of distal humeral fracture. So this one turned out to be bloody. 
bloody and the CNS turned out to be Klebsiella. So I sent back the patient to the surgeon. Okay, so before I end, I'd just like to give you this warning signs. So always compare to normal contralateral anatomy so that you won't be lost, okay? And then observe structures throughout their dynamic range when possible. And then set up the exam beforehand so as to be comfortable for both patient and the sonologist, especially in this difficult time of COVID pandemic that we all need to have with, to follow all the health protocols as instructed to us by DOH and our respective institution. Okay? And then always know the anisotropy and then acquire good recognition of normal structures so that you can differentiate it from the abnormal structures. So use copious gel because as I've mentioned, this is very painful if you're dealing with infections. Okay, and always scan all structures in two planes, longitudinal and transverse. And failure to know one's limit and that of the tools you use leads to disaster. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm sorry I took up one hour and 30 minutes of your precious time. That's so very nice. is believing. Yes, that's a very excellent lecture. I would say this is unprecedented because uh, nobody has given a lecture on infectious. That's too much, Dr. Jim. That's too much. I really appreciate you for being such a good mentor to all your trainees in your institution. And maybe more will be encouraged to uh, apply in your institution. So get ready to uh, screen them. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Melaine. That really really nice i really like it it was really good anyway let well, me just... i don't know how many of you have already seen you know as as uh, remember dr jim when you told me to do this lecture i told you really i thought we only see this in you know private and government hospitals so i guess ashley would have seen this kinds of cases you know patient demographic still matters in these kinds of cases this is really nice, really, really nice. So Dr. Lali is clapping her hands in pride. So thank you. I have uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, I think that was Jojo who asked this question. Jojo, why didn't you speak up? Congratulations, Dr. Milane, on such a very, very comprehensive lecture. Your wonderful you. insights are very, very, very much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Milane, I'm sure it's very tempting to do um, a biopsy or an aspiration on a lot of your cases, uh, but are there any cases that come into mind where it would, do you think it would be more prudent not to, uh, not to touch it and to just leave it alone? And uh, if there are cases like this, uh, could you give us some general guidelines on what we should uh, leave to be and what we should actually biopsy? Thank you. Okay, that's actually a very good question, Jojo, because that was my challenge early on in my early years in Philippine Orthopedic Center, whether to aspirate or not to aspirate. So because of the amount of patients that we have seen already, what I've noticed is that if it is not compressible on sonopalpation and it doesn't really look anechoic, it's just all hyperechoic, then most likely you really need incision and drainage because I, I, I did it several times actually back in 2015, 2016, together with the orthopedic surgeon. If it looks a little bit hazy and echoic to hypoechoic, we would attempt. Biggest that we did is 18 gauge, but we could still hardly get anything. So for me, my confidence level goes up if I see an area of unechogenicity and it is compressible on sonopalpation. If it's compressible on sonopalpation, then I'll go ahead, pyomyositis and abscess. But then I'm also very careful if it is already very near the joint or if the joint is already affected. And I usually do this together with a surgeon. The surgeon would just opt for an emergency arthrotomy. So they usually want to see it first in the ultrasound if they will try empiric antibiotic first or they would go emergency arthrotomy already so i'm very careful with when it is already in the joint i'm aggressive if it's just really an abscess or pyomyositis that is compressible within the muscles 
or cellulitis within the subcutaneous layer. But if it is in the joint and you don't really, you can really see that it's compressible, then you have to be careful because you can be dealing with malignancy versus an infection too. Great, great question, great answers. There's another question here from Azmi. Azmi, I think it's from Iraq. Would you like to uh, directly ask a question, Azmi? Hello? Hello, everyone. Hi, Doctor. Hello. Hello. I'm asking about uh, how can we differentiate about the uh, accumulation of coronic inflammatory uh, fusion from the septic one? especially okay. in the knee, in the suprapatellar pouch. Okay, in the suprapatellar bursa, if it's already chronic versus an acute septic knee, is that your question, a septic suprapatellar bursa? Yeah. If it's in the acute setting, then you would still have the abscess formation. You still have that fluid collection, the complex fluid that is compressible on sonopalpation. But if it is already in the chronic inflammatory stage, that sometimes would also turn up positive on color Doppler. There would still be hypervascularity and color Doppler, but the major defining factor there is, if it's chronic already, there's no more fluid, it is replaced by a thickened synovium, synovial hypertrophy, and that suprapatellar bursa now doesn't become compressible on solar palpation. So make use of the color Doppler, make use of the transducer compression for you to differentiate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Darmeline? Yes, Tashi. Darmeline. Because you're also in the government hospital, I'm sure you see cases like this too. Yes, I'm so happy about this lecture. Congratulations. You know, you did a very great lecture. My question thank is, you. when you have a high index of suspicion for uh, it being infectious or, um, you know, uh, something like uh, abscess, do you do like uh, antibiotic preparations before you actually aspirate or do you go ahead with the aspiration anyway and then just give antibiotic after? Okay, so we have to answer your question. That's actually a very good question because I would just like to share to everyone that we have two kinds of patients in Philippine Orthopedic Center. One patient comes from the emergency room. If it's from the emergency room and they need the ultrasound for decision-making of whether to admit the patient or not to admit the patient, then most of the time there's no empiric antibiotics started yet. So we just get the sample and send it to the laboratory. But if we get inpatient's referral, you know, 100% of the time, the orthopedic surgeon has already started the empiric antibiotic prior to our ultrasound-guided aspiration. But nevertheless, we have never encountered any complications from our stat referrals from the emergency room. We make sure we follow the sterile technique. So do you follow like a number of days before you, for example, the uh, antibiotic uh, treatment has been started like a day, three days. Uh, do you prefer aspirating it after three days or maybe or just like after they started it? Thank you. Okay, so to answer that question, we don't actually just look at the, anti the number of days that the antibiotic is given. We take a look at the blood parameters. At the time of admission, let's say if we get the patient on the third day of antibiotic, and then they already had a repeat CBC on the third day of the antibiotic, and we compare that to the a laboratory taken on admission, then we decide. Okay, if it's decreasing, then we don't need to do the aspiration on that day. But if we think that this abscess, this pyomyositis is causing the pain, the fullness in the patient, and it's limiting the range of motion, then we need to decide that maybe aspirating it, decompressing it would actually be more beneficial to the patient, even if it's just on the third day or fourth day of the antibiotic. So again, it still depends on the presentation of the case. We take a look at the blood count. We take a look at the physical examination, the clinical findings of the patient. If, because we get cases wherein 
it's not that much. Okay, it does the, the infection, the abscess, the pyomyositis, the septic arthritis doesn't cause much limitation of motion. It doesn't cause much pain to the patient. Then we decide not to do the aspiration anymore. But if it is causing too much discomfort to the patient and it is on the fifth day of antibiotic, and even if the CBC is actually improving, then because we want to give comfort to the patient, then we still go ahead and uh, decompress it with ultrasound guided aspiration. Okay, so again, uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Milane, for such a beautiful and excellent lecture that you've given us today. Expect a lot of invitation because of this uh, very nice lecture. Thank you so, so much for the uh, opportunity. I would like to thank everyone for coming.